to our online. Okay, welcome to our online salon. Uh, 数字永生哈 the future to longevity. Um, so this is a HKS. Uh, alumni event. I will just use the Chinese to first brief, uh, briefly introduce a little bit of the background. So, uh, welcome.呃，欢迎大家来到我们今天这个呃HKS这个呃活动。呃，简单先说两句背景哈，就是我们这个HKS的这个理事会其实今年刚刚呃更新成立啊。这个非常希望能够凸显我们这个学院的特点，所以成立了四个委员会，四个话题，一个是青年，一个是国际关系，一个是公共政策和建言建策，还有一个就是我们今天这个社会创新。啊，那我是这个社会创新委员会，我是我们这个呃呃理事会的成员，我叫张颖，欢迎大家。呃、uh, ，我们这个社会创新这个这个委员会呢，我们刚刚成立的时候，其实很有意思，因为这是个太宽泛的概念。但是大家有特别有热情，所以我们第一次开会的时候做的动作就是，我们先要共识一下，大家理解这个社会创新到底什么意思，因为每个人的理解都不太一致。呃，后来就发现，其实底色会有一些一致的地方，比如说，呃，我们讨论出来的共性是，大家都认为呢，非常需要去关注很广泛的这种关于社会和人类福祉的挑战，就比较宏大的这种重要长期性的命题哈。然后也非常非常强调，大家需要就是跨部门的共同的协作，从商业到社会发展到政府到发展组织等等。呃，那么就是也非常希望看重有创造性的一些解决方案，所以呢，我觉得今天我们这个话题就非常的有代表性，啊、呃，数字永生，呃，那么这个背景呢，其实是呃，真的就是人类社会就处在这个科技发展和社会发展的这个剧烈的动荡。震动之中，应该说是震动之中。然后呢，我们延续了千百年的很多生活方式和社会取向，可能都在发生一些变化。所以呢，这也让我们没有办法用单一的学科视角来理解很多新兴的事情啊，新兴的这种话题，一些重大的社会发展的命题，都必须非常的跨学科，然后跨领域的共同去看待和解决啊。所以我们就是一群，其实也是一群。这个话题的这个呃新人学习者，但是因为好奇心驱使，就选择了这样一个话题。好 ，OK， so this is a brief background of why we're holding this event, and、uh, I'll introduce a little bit about how we're gonna spend two hours together this morning. Um, first we will have our keynote speakers. They each give us about fifteen minutes、uh, speech, and、uh, the second part would be the panel discussion. Uh, the three speakers together that will last about forty-five minutes, and then we'll followed by the QA session. And meanwhile, you'll probably try.、Uh, you're encouraged to actually use the、uh, interaction, interactive、uh, kind of text. I think provided by the Zoom as a function、uh, among the all the、uh, audience as well. So that's how we're gonna do it. And、um, the audience today,、uh, I would say ninety percent are Harvard alum,、uh, with a small percentage of long non Harvard like from MIT, etc. And、um, uh, we will therefore、uh, probably the majority of the、uh, session will be in English. Uh, uh, so that everyone would、uh, be able to communicate effectively with our international speakers, etc.,、uh, with maybe one uh, exception uh, uh, later about Chinese speaker to cater our audience use the and or use the Chinese. So,、uh, well, now why don't we just go directly to our、um, keynote? Uh, we'll start by Professor Jose Cudero, and you will. Probably all read the very detailed information about our professor, and he's got a very long list of titles. And I'll pick a couple to highlight.、Um, so he's the fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Science, and I realized this organization、uh, was founded back in 1960s. And one of the founder, just give an example,、uh, was Albert Einstein. So people, you know, you all get a sense of. What kind of kind of background of this organization, and also he's the founding faculty of Singularity University,、uh, is an institution focused on issues that will impact billion people in the next ten years, 
and he's also um, transhumanist, if that's the right way to call. Uh, and in Chinese, it's 超人类主义。啊，我觉得这光这个词都就是特别值得去呃品味它的内涵。Uh, and very importantly, uh, Professor Cadero is the author of the book Death of Death, which I believe he will share some more details about later in his、uh, speech. And very importantly, he's very he's a frequent guest to China. I realize he actually has interacted with people、uh, in China quite a bit before. So,、uh, Professor Cadero,、uh, it's your turn. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And it is a pleasure to be back in、uh, China, even if virtually this time.、Uh, in fact, I am related to many different institutions.、Uh, also,、uh, a startup in、uh, China, Viria Biotech,、uh, with Stanley and, and some other people. So, I want to talk about the future of longevity and what I called eternal life, or even better, the death of death, which is the title of my. My book.、Um, this is、uh, very important because the population in the planet is stabilizing and it is beginning to decrease.、Um, in fact, in China, as you are probably aware, this year was big China.、Uh, once because India has overtaken China now in terms of population, and also because this is the year of the beginning of, of the decline in population of China. So the population is decreasing now. And if the trends continue,、uh, you can see that China will go from、uh, 1.4 billion to about 732 million people, and it will be overtaken not only by India but also Nigeria. So this is a, a situation that we need to address and consider.、Um, also, because immortality has been the number one dream of humanity since we know,、uh, since the beginning of history. In fact, the first book ever written is about immortality. The Epic of Gilgamesh in the Middle East was about immortality, or the pharaohs in Egypt. They also wanted to be immortal, and so the Book of the Dead is actually is is the book of immortality for them, or the Chinese. As probably you know, Emperor Qin Shi Huang,、uh, he believed in immortality, and that is why he built、uh, the Terracotta Army as well to protect him、uh, for the future.、Uh, or the Spanish. I am uh, uh, living in Spain, and you know, when the Spanish people、uh, discovered or rediscovered America, they were looking for the fountain of eternal youth. So all cultures,、uh, Chinese, Spanish. Uh, Mesopotamians, Egyptians,、uh, Indians—they were looking for immortality. The same with religions. If you look at the Bible, it says in Corinthians 15:26, "The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death." So death is really the enemy of humanity, of all of humanity. The enemy is not the Russians or the Arabs or anyone, anyone else. The enemy. Is death, aging, and death? That is the big enemy, and of all humans together.、Uh, I am an engineer from MIT. I worked in a, in a previous life at the beginning of my career in energy, but now I am more into biotech, specifically longevity. And I also work with the Millennium Project that began as the futuristic part of the United Nations University. And basically, we talk about what is happening in the future, all the trends, all the projections, and we just published a report about the year 2050 about technology and work and three different scenarios. In one of those scenarios for the year 2050,、uh, we have reached immortality, and we presented this at the United Nations in New York and、um, in many other、uh, big cities.、Uh, And so we are very proud that we are talking about this publicly in、uh, in front of politicians and business people.、Uh, this is important now because we are just coming out of COVID, the COVID pandemic. And if we look at the pandemic, the number one risk factor was age. Depending on your age, you could die basically if you were older, or basically nothing would happen to you if you were. Younger, so the number one risk factor is aging, and uh, uh, COVID actually was a small pandemic, a very small pandemic in、uh, world history. 
if you look at the Black Death, the bubonic plague, it is estimated to have killed 200 million people when the population was much, much lower than today. In fact, it was so horrible that um, according to recent research, one out of three Europeans died because of the Black Death. One out of every three people in Europe died because of the bubonic plague. And then we have other horrible pandemics like smallpox or the Spanish flu, which was not a Spanish and it was not a flu. But anyway, the, the Spanish flu killed about 50 million people when the population of the planet was um, four times smaller, only about 2 billion people. Anyway, if COVID is a small pandemic historically and has paralyzed the planet for two years, then we should really, really paralyze the planet for the biggest pandemic in history, which is aging. And aging is killing all of us, not only elderly people, all of us are dying because of aging. Uh, so the number one risk factor, not just for COVID, but for any other disease, influenza, cancer, Alzheimer's, a heart trouble, et cetera, et cetera, is age. Age is the big problem. Age is the big enemy. In fact, even if we could cure cancer, we could only add about two to three years of extra life. If we could cure heart trouble, maybe we could add three to four years. We cure both cancer and heart disease, maybe we add seven years of life. But if we cure aging, if we stop aging, we add decades and decades of life. So the problem, again, is not COVID, it's not cancer, it's not heart disease, it's not Alzheimer's. The problem is aging. And that is why now we talk about moving from sick care into really health care where diseases are not unrelated, but they are all related to the mother of all diseases, which is aging. Aging is the mother of all diseases, all chronic diseases, and it should be considered at the center, at the main problem to target. And so five years ago, a fantastic uh, British scientist, uh, David Wood, who studied at Cambridge, England, and I also studied at Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, we wrote this book, The Death of Death, first in my mother tongue in Spanish, uh, and it came out uh, immediately. It was number one best-selling book in Spain and all over Latin America, uh, and also in Kindle, not just in paper, number one, but in Kindle, number five. And we are donating all the royalties uh, for research, half in the USA for the Sense Research Foundation, and the other half in Spain for another science uh, foundation. After Spanish, we have been publishing in um, most of the important world languages, the biggest languages uh, in Portuguese, in French, uh, in Russian, in German, in Turkish, obviously English. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy it just came out in English uh, right now, and it is doing very well also in English. Today, I just checked, just now, uh, it is number six best-selling book in paper, and number seven best-selling book in Kindle uh, in health and biomedicine. So this is real time, so I recommend that you get the book uh, in English or very soon also in Chinese. I have a fantastic uh, prologue by my friend Aubrey de Grey, who also wrote a beautiful book called Ending Aging. And the epilogue is by no one else but Alexander Shavoronkov that we'll speak later, and who also published a fantastic book called Ageless Generation, The Ageless Generation. I recommend those books also. And um, The Death of Death, besides the prologue by Aubrey de Grey, the epilogue by Alex Shavoronkov has really a lot of recommendations by people who are very well, well known internationally, like Michio Kaku, who is a very famous physicist, uh, Japanese origin, American based. And then also another important uh, scientist, my friend uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is also an engineer from MIT, like myself. And then one of the most important uh, biologists in the world, 
uh, George Church uh, from Harvard University. Even though he's also a professor at MIT, he, he teaches at both Harvard, Harvard and MIT. So anyway, the book uh, is coming out uh, right now in Korean, Bulgarian, soon in Japanese, and of course, Chinese. We are all waiting for the Chinese edition, and then many other more languages, Arabic, Persian, Italian, Kurdish, and then Hindi. Hindi is like the fourth largest world language. So we will have covered, um, well, you can see the uh, Korean edition, the Bulgarian edition coming up, and then, once we have Chinese, we will have basically half of the world population who can read the death of death or in Chinese, eternal life. Actually, I like the Chinese name uh, more. It, it is, um, I think, a positive uh, uh, view of this. Uh, many of these ideas um, are also shared with my friend and former boss, Ray Kurzweil, uh, who I met long, long time ago at MIT at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He published this fantastic book called The Singularity is Near. And what the technological advances will do in everything from uh, computing power to health and medicine. These ideas have become so popular that most people have already heard that um, Ray Kurzweil expects that by 2045, we will reach both the singularity and also immortality, immortality by the year 2045. In fact, um, I am one of the founding faculty of Singularity University in 2009 in California at NASA Ames Research Park in Silicon Valley. And we talked about the singularity and we talk about immortality via biological rejuvenation. Um, those ideas, again, uh, are covered in, in the new edition, The Singularity is Nearer. The Singularity is Nearer than is coming next uh, year by Ray Kurzweil. And he talks about the two magic dates, magic dates based on his extrapolations of technology based on accelerating uh, change. And uh, the convergence of four major technologies, nano, bio, info, and cogno. Nano studies atoms, bio studies cells, and nano and bio are the hardware of life, hardware of life. And then if info technology studies bits and cogno technology studies neurons. And info and cogno are the software of life. And two things will happen in 2029 and 2045. According to Ray Kurzweil, he said that uh, uh, like uh, over three decades ago, then in his book, two decades ago, and then again, in this new book, the singularity is nearer because it is nearer. So anyway, by 2029, we will pass the Alan Turing test. Uh, probably all of you are familiar with the Alan Turing test. And then also we will reach longevity escape velocity, according to Ray Kurzweil. That means if we make it between 2029 and 2030, because life expectancy keeps on increasing, we will gain one year of extra life every year after 2030. That means that we will almost become immortal, um, but aging, aging still. We will live longer and longer and uh, age, but not die until 2045, when we will reach the singularity, which is a huge artificial intelligence uh, combining all the human knowledge or human intelligence combined. And also we will reach immortality through biological rejuvenation in 2045. So these are the two important dates. And then um, people like um, Elon Musk are talking how we are going to connect our brain to the cloud, to the network. So technologies are changing exponentially faster, smaller, cheaper, and better, and this continues. Um, when I went to MIT, I used the IBM punch card. A punch card was about 1K of memory, 1K. Right now, we have USB drives of one terabyte. So in 40 years, we have gone from 1K of memory to one terabyte of memory. And this keeps on increasing. This has not stopped. This continues exponentially. Um, and now, not only with computers, also with biology. And you can see 
at the incredible reduction in cost and time of sequencing the human genome. The first human genome cost over $1 billion and it took 13 years. Right now, in 2023, you can sequence your whole genome for about $200 in a couple of days. This is incredible. This is faster than Moore's law for computers. And now also, we are not only reading, we are writing genomes. We are writing genomes. This is called synthetic biology. First, we wrote uh, the genome of a virus, very small genome. Then in 2010, the genome of a bacteria bigger. And by 2045, we will be able to write and modify human genomes. And at the end, we are all data. And the human genome is only three gigabytes of data, only three. And remember, there are pen drives now of terabytes, terabytes. So we can put many humans in one USB pen drive. Um, and now we are using all this information to cure aging because many people think that aging is a disease, but a curable disease. In fact, in the last few years, we have been able to almost double the life expectancy of mice, multiplied by four, the life expectancy of mosquitoes, and multiplied by 10, the life expectancy of worms. These are called the Methuselah worms because they live almost a thousand human years equivalent. So that, is, that was the age of Methuselah, almost a thousand years. More important, we know that there are immortal cells. Immortality already exists in biology and cancer cells discovered how to be immortal. And I find this fascinating. Uh, as an engineer, you know, if I see something working, I try to replicate it and do it better. And the proof that immortality is possible is that cancer cells discovered immortality. And cancer cells didn't go to Harvard or didn't go to MIT, but they discovered immortality. So we will discover immortality too. But not only cancer cells are immortal, also the most important cells, germ cells that all of us have in our bodies, germ cells are also biologically immortal. They do not age, they don't age. So we have good cells that don't age, germ cells, and bad cells that don't age, cancer cells. Also, there are small organisms that are immortal, like hydras, some medusas, jellyfish, that are biologically immortal. And the first life forms in the planet, bacteria with round chromosomes that um, reproduce by symmetrical division, they also do not age. Life appeared to live, not to die. That is why the first life forms do not age also. So my friend uh, Aubrey de Grey wrote a pioneering book almost 20 years ago about that. And sadly, MIT Technology Review called him a charlatan. In 2005, Technology Review said that this was impossible, uh, that uh, we couldn't do that. Uh, happily, 14 years later, MIT Techni Technology Review realized that Aubrey de Grey was right and that old age is over. So look at the change of mind. This is incredible change of paradigm in only 14 years. And Ray Kurzweil, he talks about this, and there are three bridges to immortality. The first bridge in the 2010s, uh, do as your mother told you. The second bridge, uh, biotechnology that is beginning now. And the third bridge, which is nanotechnology into the 2030s until we get to the 2040s with artificial intelligence and immortality. All companies are realizing this is real, like Google created Calico, California Life Company, in order to cure aging, or um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, from Facebook, who is donating all his money to cure all diseases, including aging, or Microsoft that says that we are going to solve cancer, cure cancer very soon, because we have sequenced the genome now, and we can find the mutations that create cancer. So this is going to be the biggest, the biggest market in history, trillions and trillions of dollars. In fact, this began very small in millions. Now it is in the order of billions. Soon it is growing to trillions. And there are startups everywhere in China, in the USA, 
in Europe, all over the world, uh, tackling aging and how to cure aging. Uh, the wealthiest person in the planet, Jeff Bezos, invested with other billionaires about $3 billion billion dollars to begin with in Altos Labs. Altos Labs, which is based in Los Altos, Silicon Valley, California. And um, one of the chief scientists is the Nobel Prize laureate Shinya Yamanaka, who got the prize in 2012 because he discovered how to rejuvenate a cell. Uh, we had him a few months ago in Spain, and we gave him also the highest scientific award of Spain. And we are collaborating with him to create a center in Madrid using his technology. Also because one of the chief scientists of Altos Labs is Juan Carlos Ispizua Belmonte, who is a Spanish scientist who leads the center in La Jolla, San Diego uh, with Altos Labs. And um, he's a Spanish, so he's doing a lot of research between Spain, the USA, and China. Actually, he has many, many Chinese scientists working with him. And he was just a few days ago in Boston, and he gave a talk about rejuvenation, and everybody went to see him. And you can see police had to go in. And this was a scientific meeting. It was full of scientists and researchers, and everybody wanted to know what is happening with Ispisua and with Altos Labs and with Jeff Bezos. And other scientists from uh, Harvard, uh, David Sinclair also has been working on this and his students and being able to rejuvenate the eyes, the eyes of uh, mice and now the eyes of monkeys. We can cure blindness. Um, this is happening very, very fast. Even whole governments like Saudi Arabia have created a foundation called Evolution. Health Plus Evolution Foundation in order to work against aging. And the same uh, in Dubai, actually. I was uh, last year a couple of times in the Museum of the Future, and we had a big event about immortality where both Alex Chavoronkov and myself talked about rejuvenation technologies. Um, Alex, that will be speaking now, he also created the best scientific conference about um, aging in the world. Uh, I welcome you all to go. I will be there in uh, Copenhagen in Denmark in August and September. And I also organized another conference, which is much bigger, but it is for the general public. It's not a scientific conference, which is called Revolution Against Aging and Death. So if you want to, to meet also in person, Ray Kurzweil, Aubrey de Grey, and many other people, um, come to Los Angeles, to California in September. So in the future, I plan to be younger, not because of a Russian application like FaceApp that changes your appearance. I plan to be younger because we know biological rejuvenation is possible, but we have to meditate. Uh, the future uh, is unknown and we have to think uh, for the whole planet. I love meditation in many, many styles. And I like to think like the Chinese. The Chinese say things are complex. There is always yin and yang. In fact, yin and yang inside has little yin yang and even more little, little yin yang. So this is very complex. But the Chinese also have a fantastic phrase. Uh, you know, when there are problems, it is not just the darkness. We need to illuminate. We need to light up a candle in order to illuminate the world of the technologies coming up now. So I just want to finish with this beautiful Chinese word um, that uh, uh, can mean crisis and crisis has two characters. Uh, you know, the first one, danger, but the second one also opportunity. So we are in the biggest crisis in human history and close to solving aging. There is danger, but there is opportunity. So. Thank you, thank you so much, Xie Xie. Thank you so much, Professor Kadaro. Um, very much a, a kind of very high level overview covering from history to uh, conceptually about the, con the idea of aging and also tech and commercial, et cetera. I love the ending, actually also the beginning of the Chinese part. I actually consulted a Chinese Asian philo uh, 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 scholar on Asian uh, philosophy, particularly on today's topic about life and death uh, from a Chinese Asian philosophy uh, perspective. 
And I would suggest that actually the uh, con uh, all the kind of controversial or uh, topics related to this very much uh, um, leading topic are actually uh, all discussed, covered in the Chinese philosophy, the Asian philosophy. So that was very interesting. And you know, while we're looking forward to the future, it's also important to look back to the history. So thank you so much, Professor. And our next speaker, uh, Alex, so Borisko, I don't know if this is the right uh, pronunciation, is an expert at, in artificial intelligence for drug discovery and aging research. And obviously he's the founder and CEO of In Silico Medicine, the pre-IPO uh, startup based in uh, Hong Kong and New York. And actually he's now already in the moment in Shanghai. Uh, I was also super impressed this morning when I searched his um, publications. Uh, obviously had over 160 peer re reviewed publications since 2014 and over 10,000 citations over the last five years. And he, as Professor mentioned, he's also the author of The Ageless Generation. Uh, the book was actually translated into Chinese back in 2015. So uh, there's another way for us to follow up about uh, Alex to learn more about his ideas. So Alex, your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's going to be difficult to follow on the footsteps of uh, Jose Cadeiro, who uh, presented um, with such great level of energy. Uh, and energy is what we need in this field. Um, so uh, do get his book and um, uh, please do tell your friends to get one as well, because it provides some arguments why um, you need to be optimistic about the future which is very, very important for longevity, uh, and also um, why it is important to focus on aging research and uh, uh, allocate your own personal time and resources to contribute, contributing to this field. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for such a generous introduction. Uh, I am um, currently dialing in from Zhangjiang, um, it's the part of uh, Pudong, which is very fo focused on uh, technology I, um, uh, in Shanghai. I spent quite a considerable amount of time in China, and last two weeks I've been um, traveling all around uh, Tianjin at the World Economic Forum. And uh, uh, this week I keynoted at the WAIC, World Artificial Intelligence uh, Congress, which was mind-blowing. I can tell you that China is probably already number one in the world in some areas of AI, which gives us additional optimism. Uh, I'm going to cover um, a lot of ground with about 36 slides, so bear with me. Uh, and I probably would be able to watch the recording later on if you want to go into detail. And some of my slides are not scientific. Uh, I also must say that uh, many of the views that I'm going to be presenting uh, are not the views of Insilico Medicine, which is a very credible company focused on uh, uh, drug discovery and development. However, we also do quite a bit of research in aging uh, because um, AI is very good at recognizing the minute changes uh, in many, many, many da different data types in time. Uh, and you can train deep neural networks to predict age and also generate synthetic data using age as a generation condition. So actually aging research can help you develop much better AI uh, just by introducing new ways to uh, research causality. So there is a very credible aspect of uh, aging research that can be combined with AI. Uh, now I'm gonna share my slides. Uh, and talk uh, a little bit about uh, the convergence of uh, uh, AI, uh, robotics, uh, and aging research, and how is it going to help us uh, live longer. Um, so I need to make all the disclaimer, disclaimers, so uh, no forward-looking statements, not uh, investment advice. Uh, and um, uh, we humans are very easily uh, persuaded to optimize for objective functions that have some sort of score that allows us to compare each other um, against you know, everybody else. Uh, and most of us choose money 
as the uh, objective function. So nowadays people compare each other uh, in terms of how many, uh, how much money they have, right? So how, who is a billionaire, who has many more billions. However, um, after you reach a certain point, uh, your utility of life does not really get uh, better uh, with more money. You can do a little bit more, but uh, your personal utility stops there. And currently, you cannot convert money into time. As Warren Buffett said, you know, one of the richest people in the world, people are going to want your time, and uh, it's the only thing that you can't buy. I mean, I can buy anything I want, but basically, I cannot uh, buy time. And uh, at this point in time, whatever you do, uh, whatever you uh, have, uh, you are likely to lose it un uh, unless we figure out a way to significantly extend life and get you more time, give you the ability to buy more time. So what we should be optimizing for um, is actually uh, more time. So uh, re realizing new ways on how to uh, extend our life because that's the ultimate asset, most precious asset in the universe. And uh, unfortunately, we were evolved as species to come into this world, uh, compete, reproduce, uh, reach our peak, uh, take care of our young, and then decline and die. And that's the natural, cause, uh, natural flow of things. Uh, in China, actually, people don't even like to talk about aging because it's associated with losing. Uh, and all of you are gonna lose everything and die, right? The question is that when it's gonna happen? And many of us like to focus on prevention. So, you know, healthy eating, sports, exercise, sleep, diet, meditation, it will help, but it will help only marginally. As a matter of fact, uh, Buddhist monks, for example, in Hong Kong, the um, longest living country, uh, lo longest living city in the world, uh, part of China, um, uh, which, uh, which where, where you have, uh, you know, 10 years longer life expectancies than in the U.S., uh, Buddhist monks uh, in the area where you have very high level of health care, they live only three years longer than the general population while they, you know, starve, uh, exercise, uh, meditate, uh, and sleep. So you don't really get significant torque for ultra-optimization. And the only thing that can really help you is longevity biotechnology. Um, what we were taught in business schools globally, many of you are from Harvard, uh, is continuous improvement. And continuous improvement is not possible with aging because you naturally lose uh, in many, many areas. And uh, all of those uh, losses accumulate and eventually leads to, lead to diseases and death. So longevity biotechnology is focused on tracking, repairing, and improving your health. And right now, it's also a major economic problem, aging. So there is a chance of a possible economic collapse. So when I was um, writing the book, Ageless Generation, in uh, um, uh, 2000, 2008, 2009, um, and it was published uh, 2013, um, the U.S. Uh, national debt was uh, around, you know, thirteen trillion dollars. Uh, nowadays, it's over thirty trillion dollars. Uh, however, the net present value of future fiscal imbalance at that time was already around three hundred sixty trillion dollars. We're talking about the liability to the people over sixty-five, where Medicare, Medicaid both kick in, and you also have Social Security. So per capita, we're talking about over $35,000 a year spend on uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security for people over 65, uh, just on average, in averages, right? And as people get older, uh, it becomes even larger. And uh, those liabilities are not properly accounted for. Uh, and it's very difficult to maintain such infrastructure with very high level of debt. So there is a chance for hyperinflation and possible economic collapse due to that. Of course, there will be a reset, but a lot of people will lose money. 
Uh, and uh, in order to avoid that, we really need to extend healthy productive longevity just to decrease the healthcare liability uh, part of this uh, not of this uh, future fiscal imbalance. Uh, and um, in order to do that, we need to accelerate aging research and ensure that there is mass adoption of regenerative strategies. And we really need to increase, uh, practically increase the retirement age and go after lifelong learning and career planning. So I have published a book uh, on that, uh, thanks to the organizers for mentioning that. Uh, it's called The Ageless Generation, uh, also translated to multiple languages. Nowadays, the scientific part of this book is pretty much obsolete because we have moved on uh, in many technologies. Uh, but the economics part is actually pretty strong and it provides you with many arguments why uh, governments need to, ex uh, to spend money on regenerative technologies in order to keep the elderly healthy and preferably productive. So what can you do today to advance longevity biotechnology? Uh, actually, not much yourself, <laughs> unless you get deeper uh, involved into the field. And if you want to get deeper involved, uh, deeper, deeper involvement, I highly recommend uh, you go to the uh, aging research and drug discovery meeting in Copenhagen. It transpires every year. Uh, August 28th uh, is um, uh, the starting date. It's a five-day event and includes uh, a day on longevity medicine, where a lot of doctors attend and present as well. Um, it's run by the University of Copenhagen, uh, and it's a nonprofit event, www.agingpharma.org. Uh, it's likely to be oversubscribed in a couple of weeks, uh, so we are likely to close the registration, so hurry up uh, and meet uh, the wonderful scientists uh, at this conference. And for those of you who are um, interested in uh, kind of a more general approach to uh, aging longevity and meeting like-minded individuals, uh, you might want to go to the event that is organized by uh, Professor Jose Cordero, um, uh, which is a uh, revolution against aging and death. So there you would be able to actually um, meet a lot of like-minded individuals. I spoke at that event once as well. Um, if you want to get free courses on longevity medicine, uh, we introduced uh, the Longevity Hub, uh, which touts uh, a very um, uh, ostentatious uh, domain name, which is www.longevity.degree. Uh, you can take CME accredited courses in English and also in Chinese. Uh, and we recently introduced a course on investing in longevity. Uh, investing in Longevity 101, where we go through the history of uh, longevity biotechnology because much of it is not new. Uh, many companies in that area were formed around 2000, uh, um, early 2000s, and even you can trace back some of them into 1990s, 1980s. All of them failed. So you need to understand uh, um, the history of failure in order to make better decisions uh, on, on how to pave your way uh, in making money in this field. Uh, also, uh, we have courses uh, on ensilico.com if you are interested in disease modeling or target discovery. This is much more technical uh, and allows you to learn about the recent advances in AI and understand how to model diseases, uh, including aging and uh, identify promising targets. Here is a free course that you can find on insilico.com. Um, it's free. And uh, the first uh, week we introduced it uh, a few weeks ago, more than a thousand uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry uh, scientists uh, enrolled in this course. So it's pretty, pretty famous. Uh, now, all the nitty-gritty uh, disclaimers, I uh, just want to talk a little bit about Encilica and what we do uh, and how do we apply uh, generative AI to the study of um, uh, multiple diseases and also aging. Uh, so we are truly global. We originally started uh, at um, uh, the Emerging Technology Center's uh, accelerator at the uh, campus of the Johns Hopkins University, one of my alma maters. Uh, I'm Canadian and Latvian by citizenship, but uh, spent some time in the US. Uh, nowadays, I spend a considerable amount of my time in China. Um, uh, we have two headquarters in New York and Hong Kong. 
Um, however, the largest drug discovery site is actually in central Shanghai. And in Suzhou, I have a fully robotics lab. Uh, the company provides a platform, so technically AI software, uh, that spans the, uh, every area of uh, pharmaceutical research and development from target discovery uh, all the way to prediction of clinical trials. And we use the software to develop a pipeline of our own therapeutics. Uh, however, and most of the pipeline is focused on cancer and uh, uh, fibrosis, uh, autoimmune diseases, immunology, oncology. Uh, however, our mission has not changed since the very start. Uh, we are focused on extending healthy, productive longevity for everyone. We have two CEOs in the company. Uh, so I am responsible for AI, robotics, quantum computing, and uh, uh, global expansion. And I'm also the company founder. However, uh, the true breakthroughs at Encilico that were made over the past three years were made by Dr. Ran Fong, my uh, uh, trusted friend, uh, co-pilot, and in the past chief science officer of the company, but now he is also the uh, CEO. Um, he is in charge of 80% of the company resources. Uh, he did his PhD at Harvard, 11 years at GSK, and then he took uh, a company called Medicinal Public, uh, took it to many billions of dollars, but later he realized what our chemistry can do uh, and joined the company as a chief science officer, built a huge team of really competent, uh, highly qualified scientists uh, in uh, all over the world, but predominantly centered in Zhangjiang uh, Technology Park uh, and in Suzhou. Uh, and uh, under his leadership, we managed to take three programs into human clinical trials. So Generative artificial intelligence is transforming every step of the pharmaceutical R&D. For those of you who are not familiar uh, with how drugs are discovered, uh, this is the process. Uh, imagine that you already know the protein target that you need to go after. That's usually um, one of the drivers of the disease. Uh, and uh, many of those drivers are proteins that uh, have been um, either mutated uh, or affected in some other way. Uh, or that are regulating a critical biological process that is uh, um, the underlying cause or a driver of a disease. You find that protein, uh, then you need to identify a small molecule or an antibody to disable it. Uh, usually the process takes about uh, a year. So here you've got on the middle, the number of years it takes at every stage, a uh, number of billions of, uh, sorry, millions of dollars at every stage uh, and the probability of success at every stage. Um, so you identify a small molecule hit, you optimize it, you do preclinical experiments before you go into humans. Here you need to demonstrate that the compound is safe and effective in animal models. Uh, then you prove to the regulators that it's safe. You go into phase one human clinical trials where you test safety for chronic diseases. You would do it in healthy volunteers. Uh, in certain acute diseases, you would need to do that in patients. Uh, then you do phase two, where you test again safety and efficacy. And phase three, it's an expanded trial. So usually it takes about $2 billion or more to go from this stage to the end. And uh, the probability of success is less than 10%. However, when you are doing this from the very beginning, formulating the disease hypothesis, identifying the disease targets, um, it might take you a decade. Usually it's done by academics. The probability of success is one to 5%, so uh, 95, 90, 99% probability of failure. Uh, and usually it's funded by the government. Very rarely you see pharmaceutical companies identifying novel targets and formulating the disease hypothesis. So, so far we've demonstrated that I can take generative AI every way and go all the way into phase two human clinical trials. So last week you probably have seen a major media wave about one of our programs going into phase two human clinical trials from scratch. It was on the front page of Financial Times, Fox News covered, CNBC, CNBC. the former FDA commissioner went on TV and uh, talked about it. So it's a big thing uh, because the probability of what we have done uh, is extremely low. Uh, and we've managed to demonstrate that AI can really help at every stage. So our company has evolved. Uh, originally, we started as an algorithm company. Then we started as a software company. Uh, and uh, then we decide, decided to use the software to develop our own drugs, because that's where the money is, actually. That's what the major, that's major economic driver 
for most of the biotechnology companies. If you um, have a pipeline, fully owned uh, pipeline of uh, effective therapeutics, usually those therapeutics are worth a lot of money. So recently, a company called Nimbus uh, in the US, they completed a phase two clinical trial with an older target called TIC2 uh, for one of the dermatological indications and Takeda licensed it for $6 billion uh, four weeks after phase two was complete. Um, I think it was about $4 billion upfront. So it makes a lot of sense to develop your own therapeutics, even though it's risky and takes a lot of time and money. So we managed to raise uh, over $300 million to achieve this goal. Um, and um, uh, so in total, we raised over 400. Uh, and generative artificial intelligence enables end-to-end -end drug discovery workflows. So what we do, uh, we have um, three platforms, uh, biology, chemistry, and medicine 42, that consist of multiple apps that allow you to formulate the diseases uh, very efficiently and uh, quickly identify novel targets uh, from vast amounts of data sets that we've integrated into the platform. Uh, we integrate over 60 target discovery philosophies in there, learn on the entire world, uh, and then uh, make it so easy to use that high school students can use it, and they do. Um, we also have a generative chemistry engine that allows you to, instead of searching for a perfect needle in a haystack um, and exploring the known chemical space, it allows you to uh, set your desired parameters for the molecules you want to create, uh, and the system will imagine new molecules for you on demand. Uh, then you can synthesize and test. Uh, this system is very wildly used in the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, in clinical, it allows you to predict the outcomes of phase two to phase three clinical trials. That uh, system is currently piloted by hedge funds and banks that are trading on small and medium time biotechs that are very sensitive to phase two to phase three transitions. And uh, recently we published a fun paper uh, in uh, chemical science. It's the Royal Society of Chemistry Journal, pretty high level, together with Michael Levitt, the Nobel laureate, and my trusted friend uh, from the University of Toronto, Alana Sporogudzik, was actually in the past a very famous Harvard professor uh, working on the, uh, generative quantum computing. And uh, in this paper, we demonstrated we can take hepatocellular carcinoma, one of the uh, pretty deadly cancers, uh, give it to pandaomics, uh, give a number of data sets to pandaomics. It uh, identified promising targets. Uh, we also picked the targets that didn't have crystal structure. Uh, one of, those, of them was CDK20. Uh, did alpha fold for crystal structure prediction. Alpha fold by itself, uh, it does not really allow you to identify uh, identify um, promising molecules. It's a, it's a tool uh, which is a small piece of the large drug discovery puzzle, um, uh, but it's very, very, of course, it was a big breakthrough by DeepMind. I uh, have to acknowledge that, but uh, here we demonstrate the practical utility of this tool. Uh, and we give this structure to Chemistry32, a uh, very rapidly it identified uh, several hits uh, that were pretty weak, so 7.3 micromolar, uh, then we give it back to Chemistry 32, and it generated uh, pretty active hits, uh, 180 uh, nanomolar, so which is very drug-like. We synthesized them, tested them, and tested all the way uh, into uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. It worked, uh, and uh, we published. It actually took uh, several months to publish, but to complete this experiment, it took us 50 days, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, Generative artificial intelligence, uh, even though we can do those you know, 50 day experiments, we also published the Nature Biotech paper 2019, where we used the generative tensorial reinforcement learning system, allowing us to generate molecules and test all the way into mice in 46 days. However, when you go into the real tar the drug discovery programs, you cannot really cut too much time out of the process because it's very well regulated. That's why when, for example, uh, Dr. Cadero um, uh, talks about technological uh, progress. In the pharmaceutical industry, it will be much slower. It's actually the safe harbor where you can hide from the many innovations and uh, technology acceleration because it's such regulated field. In order for you to go human clinical trials, you need to perform dozens of animal experiments that will take you a very long time 
And after that, you still need to prove safety and efficacy in patients. Uh, you will not be able to uh, uh, start selling the drug um, without the human clinical trials. And that's actually for a good reason, because you need to demonstrate safety and efficacy. I would be very, very worried uh, if I had the ability to take my drugs into humans right away. Uh, however, AI can really help you increase productivity and increase the probability of success. So some case studies from our group are from zero to preclinical candidate, that's kind of one step away from our human clinical trials in our under 18 months, uh, nine preclinical candidates in 2022. Uh, that's actually, in my opinion, as the record, usually big pharmaceutical companies nominate four to five in small molecules using internal R&D. So we have accelerated quite dramatically. Uh, and managed to demonstrate that in one uh, case, we have identified a novel target, generated small molecules using AI, uh, took it all the way to human clinical trials with the small pilot called phase zero, eight healthy volunteers in Australia, and then uh, two uh, trials, uh, US and uh, China and New Zealand, uh, demonstrating safety in healthy volunteers. And now it went into phase two human clinical trials uh, one of a kind program out of generative AI. Now we also have uh, over 30 programs, uh, 14 uh, small molecule preclinical candidates nominated to date. Uh, many of them are in IND enabling, uh, three are in human clinical trials out of AI. So AI really allows you to create valuable therapeutics very, very quickly uh, and with very high level of quality. So something that you cannot really find in a known chemical space. So now I'll switch gears very, very quickly to cover some uh, of our work in aging, because that's what this uh, um, lecture is all about. So is aging a disease? Uh, a lot of people are arguing about that. I, of course, subscribe to this philosophy. However, it doesn't really matter. If you are doing pharmaceutical drug discovery, you still will need to purpose the drug to a specific indication because if you want to fund the drug discovery program, which costs you, again, sometimes a few billion dollars, uh, you want to ensure that the shareholders get paid at the end and uh, are compensated for massive investments. So in order for you to do that, you will need to prioritize uh, and purpose the drug towards a certain disease. So, uh, but if your drug works in aging, it should work in some disease. So if you find that disease and purpose it uh, towards that disease, but it also works in aging, you uh, develop an effective therapeutic and aging effects are free. So that's the philosophy that we're pursuing. We're looking uh, for targets that are implicated in both aging and disease. And many of those targets are uh, have those properties. Recently, we published a paper showing that uh, we can identify those dual purpose disease targets uh, using our AI-powered uh, target discovery platform, and then purpose those targets uh, towards uh, different hallmarks of aging. So um, there, are, there is an established framework uh, that the scientific uh, community agrees up, uh, on in terms of what are the key drivers of aging. Uh, and uh, uh, there have been identified uh, uh, more than 10 different areas that are driving aging. Here are just some of them, published in a very famous uh, paper um, uh, in the um, uh, last 10 years. Uh, since then, it has evolved. So here you have different hallmarks of aging, cellular senescence, this, this regulated nutrient signaling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what we've done, we've uh, allocated targets that we've identified with dual purpose. Um, into the different areas of uh, aging, uh, hallmarks of aging, and categorize them by, high, uh, by confidence, novelty, uh, drugability. Uh, and um, uh, those are the three features that you need in order to evaluate the risk of a therapeutic program. So usually you're looking for an optimal balance of novelty, confidence, and commercial tractability. So this system allows you to actually incubate companies if you want to, uh, if you're a venture capitalist, for example, and go after a specific risk profile that you're comfortable with. 
usually and depending on how much money you can fundraise and what are the indications you are going after. Uh, some uh, practical examples. Peter, uh, one of the yeah. Alex will need to uh, speed up a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll just keep us try, uh, one 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 case study where we did a fun study with um, uh, well, well, really cool study in ALS, some Asia associated disease, partnered with uh, Mary Chutkovitz, um, chair of neurology at Harvard, her counterpart at uh, Hopkins. Uh, Jeffrey Rothstein and the wonderful neuroscientist here in um, China out of Tsinghua University, Lubai, uh, uh, and demonstrated that we can identify novel targets and drug story purpose for ALS, and uh, uh, demonstrated published paper showing that our AI system can identify targets that reverse the ALS phenotype uh, in a fly model out of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and uh, Lubai's company out of Tsinghua University for B Technologies, they actually managed to enroll uh, about 60 patients in a clinical trial in under a year. So that shows you the power of China, the speed of China, and uh, many diseases in China are not rare. So, uh, and of course, here people work extremely hard and uh, uh, you can really achieve miracles uh, if you repurpose, if you don't go after your own chemistry. And now I'll just talk very, very briefly. I know that I'm off, out of time, but it's a fun, fun thing to, 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 to check out. The integration of AI with robotics. And uh, many of you are aware of you know, multimodal transformer uh, neural networks. Uh, for example, some instructional ones like ChatGPT are very popular. But DeepMind and uh, Google in general pioneered this field. In early 2022, they published a fun multimodal transformer called Gato. I was blown away. That's me at the uh, Gordon's research conference on aging, uh, uh, blown away. Uh, we developed our own called Precious One GPT that is trained on methylation data and normal expression data with metadata uh, to predict uh, age and also generate synthetic data with age as a generation condition. Uh, and then we take this model that is trained on aging on multimodal biological data and transfer the weights onto another transformer that is trained on also methylation expression in diseases. So now we can find those dual purpose therapeutics uh, or dual purpose targets that may be actionable. We give it to our pandaomics platform and it prioritizes those targets into matrices like that where every row is a potential target uh, and every column is an AI score uh, trying to give you confidence that this, um, uh, this target is implicated in uh, uh, aging and disease. So, and we now decided to use those transformer neural networks to run the actual physical laboratory to very rapidly identify targets and validate them. And um, uh, we built a physical lab. So this is me and Suzhou in April, 2022 uh, in a wonderful, um, uh, free trade pilot zone uh, called BioBay. Uh, Michael Yin, the CEO of BioBay, is a true genius. He didn't give us uh, uh, financial resources, but he helped us a lot with infrastructure during COVID. So we had a lot of engineers bubbled there and uh, uh, working on uh, uh, implementing and embedding this uh, uh, wonderful fully automated robotics facility uh, into a building. So it's one large robot that's me sleeping there. This is real footage, so if you come to the lab and visit, uh, that's what you're going to see. Uh, you come in, it's face activated entrance, pretty epic, doesn't cost much compared to the robots. So you're right, you've got dimmed windows, you can undim them and uh, see the robots in action if it's not confidential. I've got six fully interconnected robotics uh, rooms. Um, here there are all those rooms in miniature on display. Uh, we opened it uh, in December, so December 29th. As you remember, that was the grand opening of China. So <laughs> also some people were coughing their lungs out, right? So uh, we still went to work, even if we got COVID. And um, uh, here are senior officials looking at uh, our robotics facilities. Also a lot of pharma companies came in. This is re real footage. So you get uh, tissues or cells into the robot. You, give, you feed it the cells. Uh, the robot picks it up grinds it, microplates it, does quality control, 
no fungus, no mycoplasma, passes it to a different room. We've got our own autonomous guided vehicles there. Uh, they take multiple paths. Part of that sample goes into the incubator, part goes into the imaging station. You get multiple types of imaging. Um, so you get the phenotype of your sample. Then we have an NGS prep room where we do three types of um, uh, NGS uh, lab library preps. Give it to a Lumina sequencer, get the data, feed it to our AI layer, predominantly spondoomics and then clinical combined. Here, magic happens. AI picks the targets automatically. Uh, no human intervention, no human bias. Uh, picks the compounds that may work on those targets uh, from the compound hotel, does quality control, aliquots those sample, those uh, compounds onto 96 well plates, and then incubates the samples uh, that you've collected initially with those compounds at different concentrations, different incubation times, and then repeats the cycle. So we get transcriptional response, methylation response, deep phenotyping, and then feed it back into AI. And it gets either rewarded or punished if it picked good or bad targets, but also it explores the target space automatically. So we get genuine uh, scientific uh, serendipity. So we can find uh, additional possible targets that may work in uh, uh, the disease. But of course, uh, every time we process the samples with methylation and transcriptomics, we also do aging clocks. So we, of course, Sorry, use this Alex. lab for diseases. Yeah. Uh, we really have to uh, close. Yeah, sure. Let's uh, finish that and uh, go to the discussion. OK, perfect. Thank you. It's a lot of amazing uh, technical details, as well as how things were actually tra transformed into practice, into real business. Uh, it's a very informative um, sharing. Thank you so much, Alex. And uh, the third speaker, um, I'll probably use Chinese to introduce because it's a, a old friend uh, uh, and very familiar uh, by a lot of uh, Chinese. Wu Xu, uh, 多介绍哈，就是哎，我好像没有开这个视频。呃，吴旭多介绍是咱们这个携程的创办人之一，对中国的人口问题的这个远见和政策的倡导而出名。那近。近两年，更是因为我觉得是公司的这个生育友好政策，让很多女性非常心仪的呃，这个公司的这个背后的呃创始人之一，是非常难得的学术学者型企业家啊、呃，梁建章先生。那公司的同事都亲切的称呼他为 James 啊、嗯。那我不多介绍了，直接就请 James 呃来做分享。你可以直接用中文，如果更方便的话，然后也请分享一下您的那个 PPT。OK，Can、okay, you see my slide？ Um, not yet. Oh yeah. Okay, just one second. Okay. Yeah. Can you see my slides now? Mm. Actually, no. Is that me? No. Okay. I... Yeah. You can see the slides, right? Oh, now I think it's coming. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so, okay, I just uh, gonna use one slide because I think we were short on time. I think, uh, yeah, I learned a lot from the two previous speakers, and they, you know, fascinating uh, presentation. And they will be actually first thing I want to mention. They will be very interested to read my recent science science fiction novel. Called after immortality, after immortality, exactly talks about what happens when the immortality drug was invented, like invented in 2050, and what happens to the society and human nature, what happens to the international politics, the economy, and everything. Uh, that would be very interesting. <laughs> Uh, a novel for, for you guys to read, or for anybody who, who's interested in uh, immortality. Okay, um, well, today I'm going to talk about AI and philosophy. Well, well, this topic is uh, normally, um, you know, it's quite different from what I would normally talk about, the, uh, you know, travel and uh, uh, demographics, <laughs> but it's kind of related. And it talks about, uh, you know, under a very popular topic, you know, 
and then the background of a very popular topic, which is uh, AI and the large language model. Uh, it really, I think, shocked many people, including me, what the white can do. Then what, it, what it did is really simple, right? Just combining a bunch of neurons, so you got some level of general intelligence, which is shocking. But, well, the way it did it can tell us a lot more about the future of AI and how it will affect the economy and the society. Now, one thing we got, got from this model is that uh, we sort of um, realized, you know, a lot of my, a lot of my argument and uh, conclusion are, are quite uh, uh, controversial and speculative. So you, you guys have to be open-minded about it and, uh, you know, we can talk about it, but they are very fun to think about and very interesting to discuss. So what we got from this large language model, the fact that it is a black box, right? It, nobody can interpret it, nobody can predict it. It has some hallucination, but at the same time, it seems to be intelligent. So the fact that it is a black box tells us intelligence is kind of equal to creativity. And also intelligence and creativity is kind of equal to unpredictability. So unpredictability and intelligence is kind of like a, a, the two sides of the same coin. So if you want intelligence, you know, you, you, you have to, you know, it has to be unpredictable. So, you know, even though unpredictable is a bad thing, you know, in the high risk, but it's sort of what you would have to get uh, if you want intelligence. So, um, so on the one hand, AI seems to be able to do everything. You know, I can talk about you know what, how it will affect jobs, what kind of jobs we will try to replace. So in the near future, like in 20, 30 years, it's not going to be affecting job market too much because a lot of jobs, like service jobs, will not be replaced by AI. But in the very long run, like you know, two generations, AI can almost do everything can replace you know, whatever a human can do. And as long as we train them, um, you know, it has to be trained properly to do the kind of things that AI was asked to do. So for example, AI is currently, or AI algorithm doesn't have emotion or uh, value or moral, but those traits like moral and value and emotion are really from evolution, you know, all the, the, the uh, millions of years evolution and the human learned or the genetics or the human brain started to behave um, to a certain moral value or certain emotions because human fear death or you know, want to self-preserve and want to replicate. But if we train AI, to have this objective function, meaning to you know, self-preservation and to replicate, AI will have, will be able to have, or at least simulate those emotions. So even emotions can be built, engineered, if you train the AI algorithm properly. So it's really, on a fundamental level, we can think that AI really can do everything that human can do in the very long run. But, Will we or should we allow AI to do everything that we are currently doing? Uh, that's a different question, okay? Uh, my, my answer or my guess is no, uh, we will not let AI do this, these things. First of all, it's high risk because AI is a black box and it inevitably is unpredictable. So if we allow AI too much autonomy, for example, to lead innovation. For, certainly AI can help with a lot of the tasks involved in innovation, but we will not allow AI to lead innovation because you know, innovation inherently is unpredictable and high risk. So if we want to control the risk of um, you know, new product or innovation, we will not let AI on the driving seat. So we will still have 
human to do the, to lead the innovation. The other side is that you know human needs to do something, right? If AI do all the jobs, what human can do? It is fun and rewarding to do innovation. So I think the human will continue to do innovation just for the fun of it and also for risk control. Okay. Um, the other way to look at it is to just compare AI and our children, right? <clears throat> so children are very intelligent and also predictable, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you have children, they are taught by teachers and parents, but they are unpredictable. But think about it. Is, is everything okay? Yes, now it's back to okay. We just lost you okay. a couple of seconds, but it's fine. Okay. So imagine like both AI and the children did something unpredictable or did something out of your expectation, unexpectedly did something, you know, crazy. Okay. If children did something unexpectedly, you will feel okay. That's my child. You know that you know they they will they look like us and they 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 they, they are like us. So it's fine. And the children will need to do something different from us. But AI does something unexpectedly. You'll be really scared because AI is completely a different you know, a, a thing than, than human. So, you know, we will trust our children a lot more. Even though AI and trust, both of them are unpredictable, we'll trust far more children than AI. So I think, you know, especially innovation, we will, human will continue to uh, leave it, it, mo the, the most important task of you know, innovation to our children or, or to ourselves rather than let, let AI to lead the active innovation. So that's just my, on the background. So I think in the future, more and more people will be doing innovation, fewer and fewer people will be doing routine jobs or just using the tools because the using the, app, the, using the tools, that part can be automated. But innovation itself uh, will be led by human. So in the future, innovation will be more and more important, a big, bigger, bigger part of the whole world economy. And more and more people will be doing the jobs related to innovation. Okay, that will lead my main argument or my main philosophical conclusion of what will happen after, you know. Uh, AI or the technology becomes really, really uh, advanced, uh, which is the biggest question of all, right? The meaning of life. Oh, okay, I gave you the conclusion first. The meaning of life will be innovation and heritage. Okay, well, this is obviously a philosophical question, right? Meaning of life is the, the biggest philosophical question and a lot of philosophers uh, from the West and the East talk about it, but not I mean, I, I think none of them talks about in, innovation because innovation in the, historically is not a big thing in any society, okay. Um, but in the future that will change. Innovation is a key part of the whole, whole economy and a key part of the whole society. Um, I'll talk about heritage a little bit. Not many philosophers has talked about heritage either, uh, because heritage or you know uh, procreation is not a problem because you know you have even you know, everybody naturally want to produce more children and the population is growing. It's never a topic, except Confucius. Confucius really talked about uh, you know in traditional. Chinese uh, philosophy talks about you know, passing down your you know, generation to generations, but Confucius didn't talk about innovation. Confucius thought every child should you know, do exactly what the parents told them to do and do exactly the same thing 
so that keep the stability of the society. Actually, other philosophy also more put more weights on stability than innovation. So innovation never a big part of the philosopher. But I will argue that philosophy, uh, I will argue innovation is going to be the key part of the uh, the meaning of life, the biggest question uh, of, uh, of all time. Now, first of all, I would argue that because AI will take over all the jobs except innovation. Innovation will be the biggest part of the economy. Will be what most people will be working on and most of the, 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 the wealth will be created by innovators. So if you wanna be successful, uh, you wanna be an innovator, right? As a person, that's true. And it's also true for a company. You wanna be an innovator to make a lot of money or successful innovator to make a lot of money. And especially true for a country, because country cannot use the social redistribution uh, to you know, give more money or uh, uh, give more welfare to the poor or, or non-innovators. You know, in, within the country, non-innovators uh, can still get government subsidy. But from a country level, if you are not an innovative country, you know, you're not going to be uh, getting a lot of a big a, a, a big slice of the pie of the, the whole wealth created by the world. So it is especially for for true for for a country. So that's the you know innovation will be essential will be for all the economic activities and for competitive uh, com competitiveness. Third, why innovation is 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 the, is the, the meaning of life. Innovation is actually instinctively fun. Uh, people, I mean, past philosophers didn't talk about that much, right? Because they want stability. But actually, you know, human nature is looking for novelty, right? You want to travel to a new place. You want to read a new book. You want to have a new idea. Otherwise, you get bored. But that's, I think, the one of the most important aspects of what we call happiness or fun. But it also is probably the highest, I believe it's the highest source of achievement, you know, by, you know, your reason or your thinking or your you know, reasoning, if you can, re you know, reach a new conclusion or experiencing something of a new thought, a new understanding or discover something new about nature or the culture. I think that's the highest source of achievement. I mean, a lot of you probably will resonate. And lastly, I think innovation, why innovation is should be the, the meaning of life or should be the, the, the purpose is that, um, you know, now we, you know, think human is probably very unique in the universe, coming from millions of evolution. And when also we have intelligence and we have all these technologies, and you know, we are far better than any other species or anything in the, in the world. Far more intelligent, far more interesting, right? If there's a God who designed the universe, what well, would he be happy to see? He, want, he will be happy to see a, um, like human, us, will be, you know, continue to innovate and to realize whatever ambitions or, you know, we may want to go to the moon or go to the Mars. Uh, we want to be maybe create a technology that allows the longevity. We may live forever. Or, you know, we want to play with this, uh, what God has given us or the universe has given us and realize the fullest potential. And that's an interesting purpose of life. So I give some, you know, philosophical argument why innovation uh, should be essential. Uh, should be central to, to, to the meaning, to the question of the meaning of life. Now, why we added heritage to innovation? Because innovation and heritage should come together, right? So if you have, just have heritage without innovation, or like, okay, if we have a longevity, we can live forever. That's exactly what my novel, science fiction, has predicted. And if we have heritage and longevity without, uh, without innovation, then we'll be just a very boring and stagnant and never, you know, 
every generation is the same, it's gonna be a very boring and it's uh, very good outcome. Well, we may live forever, but it's gonna be not very boring, right? So it's heritage without innovation is not good. But innovation without heritage is also bad, right? If we don't control our risk, you know, we may kill ourselves. Uh, we may have a nuclear war or we may, you know, damage the planet and then make it unlivable. So innovation needs to also consider sustainability, right? What, you know, what innovation is, can be judged or can be measured by how much heritage this innovation has, right? By citation, right? If innovation is, um, you know, is valuable or is, it's a great innovation because this innovation has a lot of heritage and a lot of citations, for example, right? Okay, so um, so innovation and heritage will be, I think, uh, 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 together will be uh, the future philosophy uh, of the uh, to to to, uh, to, uh, to answer the question of the purpose of life, and that's the biggest uh, uh, philosophical question. Well, <laughs> when I say innovation and heritage, uh, there are two sides of it. Okay. I talked a lot about ideas, you know, scientific discovery, you know, arts, you know, literature, but that also has a meaning for procreation. So, you know, you know a lot of people talking about gene and the meaning, or I just talked about meaning, but also gene is also part of innovation. So the fact that the human society has reached the, the level of, you know, prosperity today is because not just the, the technology and the, the culture that we inherited from our ancestors, but also the genes, you know, have 8 billion people, the genes we inherited from our ancestors. So some people may have created a new, you know, science theory or a, a, a new novel or a new book, but other people, you know, have created many children will have endless possibilities going to the future. So innovation and heritage is what I mean is not just the means, but also the genes. So we, that's, you know, uh, part of my argument. Why more people, <clears throat> you know, I'm totally on the side of that, you know, believing more people, more population will help, will really in, increase uh, at the level of innovation and it will really be a plus for humanity. So not just having more innovation uh, for scientific discovery, but also a more innovation of genes, you know, creating more children. Um, you know, in China uh, currently has a population problem. You know, I'm spending a lot of time advocating for the government to give more family subsidy to allow young people to have more children. This, you know, I have just recently wrote a book about uh, you know, the population strategy, which talks about, um, you know, what's the best economic policy to promote uh, more uh, children. Um, if you're interested, you can, uh, you yeah, know, get, get that too. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, that's my uh, uh, brief uh, discussion of my, you know, AI and the philosophy topic. But also, I wanted to uh, guys to look into our uh, the population problem, uh, which is population strategy, which talks about the very um, interesting relationship between population and innovation. Now, some of that is coming from my academic research on the relationship between demographics and innovation. But also, I mean, I think you guys should also read my science fiction longevity and uh, uh, after immortality. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, James. Um, I actually would also add that we should, um, uh, for, particularly for those people based in Shanghai, we should also try to go to the uh, show that is uh, developed, directed based under the uh, fiction uh, by James, the uh, After Longevity, uh, that is going to be on next weekend, I believe, from the 14th. It seems like a very interesting story to me personally, uh, which uh, really connects with the core message James just, just shared. 
uh, you know, the kind of when people are facing the dilemma or the situation between longevity and uh, heritage innovation, really, as an individual, how are you going to choose if you have to choose one of the two? So um, if there's anyone going uh, in Shanghai, uh, I would just join you. <laughs> so uh, raise yeah, yeah, later. definitely. Uh, this weekend, <laughs> if you're in Shanghai, yeah. And I think yeah, tickets are definitely. still available through trip, through Xiechang, yeah. Yes, yes. Actually, we've got uh, some special discounts just for the cover uh, along joining this event. Perfect. Mm -hmm. OK, so we're going to uh, move to the panel discussion uh, now. Obviously, uh, we are probably going to have to compress a little bit of the time we'll spend on the panel to about 20 minutes or so. And uh, we'll have my uh, partner, uh, event partner, uh, Stanley, to host the panel. Stanley. Yes. Thanks, Ian. Thanks for Ian's hoster. Thanks for the insight for sharing from Jose, Alex, and uh, James in keynote sharing session. So let me give a brief about myself. Uh, I'm Diao Xiaoli Stanley, and I'm a Harvard Kennedy School and China Society of Social Change Organization member, and I'm also a Yongsheng Alliance member. So in the uh, coming um, panel discussion, to better understanding of longevity, we will involve the three speakers in the panel discussion. Since the tight schedule, uh, I think firstly I'd like to ask all of you a very quick question. Since we, I think we have reached the consensus that longevity matters. So from your perspective, I think uh, uh, maybe someone has shared with that uh, 2045 will be the singularity that longevity will come. But what's your point? When will that arrive? I think maybe all of you will give us uh, the quick question. The first is a uh, Cordero. Alec, Jose? Uh, yeah, uh, based on the book of my friend again, that is coming next year, the singularity is nearer. There are two magic dates, and I believe them because he has been making forecasts for almost half a century, and he's 83% correct, according to a review of his predictions. And the two magic dates are uh, uh, longevity escape velocity or the Methuselarity or the singularity of Methuselah, uh, which is the time when we will basically live long enough to live forever. And that should happen between 2029 and 2030. That is very close in seven years. And the second year is for rejuvenation technologies, which is 2045. So those are the two dates. I truly believe this is happening. And uh, that's my take on it. Thanks for your insight. So for the artificial intelligence uh, in um, drug discovery, so what's your perspective, Alex? Uh, well, I have to be very conservative in my predictions when it comes to uh, utilizing anything that is you know, pharmacological or within the traditional medical paradigm. I think that we're probably about two decades away from uh, um, the moment where we can significantly reverse biological age uh, using traditional means. Uh, on the other perspective, if we were to do a thought experiment and go beyond uh, what is possible, or well, I mean, what is uh, ethically possible. So imagine if you were to consider cloning and uh, uh, you know head transplant. Uh, which is not impossible today. So that technology would allow you to live for a very long time already today, right? So in some areas, if you were to just look at, um, uh, you know, thought experiments that go beyond uh, all ethical norms, some of the technologies are already here today that hypothetically can prolong your life for, uh, you know, several fold. So, um, However, if we stick to traditional paradigm in drug discovery, it's going to take us a couple of decades. Thanks for sharing. So also for James, since you mentioned, we mentioned about for the Chinese demographics uh, uh, situation, the young generation, they don't have the willing to have the baby in their old age. Uh, so what's your, anyway, what's your opinion for the uh, problem? So when will the longevity uh, reach to us? What's your, what's your point? Oh, uh, okay. Um, um, well, first of all, I think um, your longevity is not going to solve the um, low fertility problem. So even though with longevity coming, we still need government uh, to have those uh, sort of uh, 
uh, uh, you know, subsidy to, to family to help young people to have more children. Anyway, my, my, I'm not an expert, <clears throat> but I'm just looking at the difficulty and um, how the society will uh, allow or control the kind of uh, technology development. So of all the technologies, I think uh, uh, longevity is the least controversial uh, compared to like AI, compared to you know, genetic engineering, compared to um, you know, virtual reality, those kind of things. I think uh, nobody will object <laughs> to have more longevity. Um, the other interesting comparison is to, to compare that with uh, the artificial womb. So one way of solving young people not wanting to have more children is to have artificial womb, right? But artificial womb is actually, I think, a much easier technology than longevity, okay? But, you know, very few scientists in the world are working on it, because why? Because it's very controversial from an uh, ethics point of view. And you know, what if it has a, you know, 1% chance of failure? And what happens to the baby, right? Um, but for longevity, the other way, as long as even it just has 1% of chance of success, still, everybody wants to try it. So it's the least controversial. And I think it will happen faster than other, you know, like singularity. I don't believe that will happen very soon because, you know, the, the government will control the AI. You know. um, it's very controversial actually. Uh, but uh, I think the longevity uh, will happen sooner than other technologies. Exactly what happens, so you can read my science fiction. Uh, um, in, in my novel, I predict like a later part of the century. Um, yeah, so I think that we, we, we all, I may not be, um, you know, <laughs> uh, live long enough to, 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 to benefit from that, but I think a lot of the people, young people today probably will live much longer, yeah. Can I make yeah. an argument here? And uh, so I want to disagree a little bit. So there are many people working on artificial wombs. There is at least four companies that already demonstrated POC. Uh, so okay. I think that oh. for China to repopulate, uh, it's, it oh. might not be a bad idea to have okay. uh, an well, industrial I'll strength learn facility. About that yeah. from you. If you, you know, can, I'm not sure you have my email. Okay, um, let me exchange. Uh, you know, if you let me. Oh, know you can, you can, you can scan my WeChat. So that's oh, my okay. WeChat. If you can scan it. <laughs> okay, I'd <laughs> okay. love yeah. to hear more about that. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. We'll have to loop you uh, together by the email in the uh, after our events. Yeah, so very interesting um, discussion on the timing when the longevity will arrive. I think maybe there exists different ideas, but <clears throat> I believe that the trend for the longevity for the um, longer lifespan is uh, is very uh, certainty. So I'd like to use the Chinese questionnaire from uh, one of our audience in Chinese. So this question is for James. 在地生育和 寿命预期增加的情况下，有哪些新的需求、新的创业机会正在产生？所以我想啊，就像呃，Jose教授提到的，呃，危机危机有危也有机，我们想更多看一看机会在哪里。请James啊，给大家一些insights。Well, I think the only sector that's going to be benefit from you know aging. Uh, or low fertility is uh, for sure is healthcare, right? Healthcare mm -hmm. is going to be much bigger and bigger. And some industry are relatively neutral, like uh, you know, travel, travel. You know, old people and young people both can travel. Um, uh, uh, you know, and 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 most industries uh, they um, like most of the durable goods, the real estate, they peak around the age of. Um, 40, 50. Uh, so when you have a large group of age 40, 50, these um, uh, industries will, will benefit like manufacturing. Um, for that, um, you know, China still have like, you know, 20 years or 30 years of good economic time. But, um, you know, eventually the low fertility we have today will, will hurt Chinese economy like in 20, 30 years. Well, some, of course, some industries like education, and, you know, it's already 
negatively affected because you have you know, many many fewer children. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for the sharing. I always still believe that uh, still, even though with a lot of uh, strand and uh, there existed an opportunities so we'd like to explore, especially for the Harvard alumni. Mm. Uh, another question is for Jose. So from your perspective, what are the challenges and the risks if we would like to reach the longevity? I think uh, you may be the most uh, uh, optimistic uh, speaker among uh, the, all of the three. So, but for the, for the challenges and the risks, what's your point? What's your opinion? Well, I think that uh, curing aging is like curing cancer and curing Alzheimer's and curing heart trouble and curing Parkinson's. So there is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing bad. So I believe it is the most novel cause that we can do is to dedicate our lives to cure aging, not just curing cancer or Alzheimer's, but curing aging, the mother of all diseases. Therefore, I don't see bad consequences. I don't see problems. Uh, like we want to cure cancer, well, we want to cure aging. And uh, the outcome is going to be incredibly positive also in terms of economic development. There is a new idea called longevity dividend. And the longevity dividend is how much positive outcome, how much um, money we are going to be producing if we are not sick. You know, being sick is very bad for you, uh, for the family, for the country, for the economy, for everybody. So we have to stop being sick. And that, that is called longevity dividend, not being sick and uh, living a healthier life. So it, it challenges, I mean, negative challenges, none. There is nothing wrong. There is nothing bad with being younger, healthier, longer. Therefore, I think this is the best thing we can ever do uh, to cure aging. It is positive for everybody and it is positive for the economy. And it is also positive for the environment and for peace, uh, for the environment. Let me tell you, if we are going to know that we are going to be living indefinitely, we will take care of the environment because we don't want to, to live in a polluted, in a dirty planet. And if we know we are going to be here, we will want it clean. We will want it safe. We will want it peaceful. We want a peaceful planet if we are going to be here for decades, for centuries, for millennia. So longevity is the solution to basically all the problems. It is the solution to environmental issues. It is the solution to, to crime, to war and everything. And it is a novel uh, cause also. In OECD countries, in the most advanced economies, 90% of the people die of aging, 90%. That means all of other diseases together only kill 10% of the people. What is that 10%? Uh, it is uh, malaria, it is terrorism, it is wars, it is climate change, it is AIDS, et cetera, et cetera. These are real issues, they are. But if you add them all, they are only 10% of the deaths in advanced economies. So what we need to cure besides climate change or AIDS or malaria is aging. Aging is what is killing all of us. Gotcha. Yeah, so I think maybe we could try to figure out some more tricks to promotion for the, all the sites or in the society to let more people, government, business, and price be aware of that longevity and aging will be mm -hmm realized in the near future, and we could make that. And the additional question is for Alex. So we mentioned about the eight longevity matters. Uh, from your perspective, uh, how to achieve the goal? How to how does AIGC will accelerate that? So um, I think that from the human perspective, if you are starting today, uh, you should first get into the field and uh, learn from the experts in terms of what's available. That's why I found that that uh, Aging Research and Drug Discovery Conference in Copenhagen. Uh, so all of you should go there and check it out. Uh, right now, you need to become a venture capitalist of your life. So just like what you do with money, uh, you know, accepting a certain amount of risk for a certain amount of return, uh, you will need to do the same thing with your life, right? Because many of the technologies that uh, have that hold a lot of promise in life extension, uh, they do have side effects. 
and uh, they do work on animals, but uh, human trials are very far away. And even if there are human trials that demonstrate that you've got some aging clock reversal, uh, you might not necessarily be able to be convinced that uh, you know, they're gonna work. So if you want to apply AI to this problem, uh, well, I just gave a lecture on how to do that, right? So you need to start from first principles and ensure that you develop a first, first the commercially tractable uh, business model that can sustain itself because uh, if you are just talking about one drug costing about $2 billion to develop, uh, and you know over 10 years and 99% uh, probability of failure, uh, for a longevity therapeutic, it will take even more, right? Because you later need to repurpose and demonstrate it also works in aging. So you need to ensure that whatever you do in AI-powered drug discovery for longevity, you need to ensure that your business model is sustainable because this beast is very hungry, it's insatiable, <laughs> it will want to eat. So you need to ensure that your business model is solid. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, I think this, with the trend of uh, AIGC chip, uh, chat GPT, uh, the AIGC will give a more important role in conquer um, disease and uh, uh, near around the longevity. And the last question is for um, all of us. I think this question is related with philosophy. Uh, this question is also from one of our audience. Uh, he says that will physical immortality and digital immortality be compatible together? If human beings ask that, what's the meaning of innovation and uh, inheritance? 他是用中文来讲的，我同时用中文再说一遍。生命的永生和思想的永生是并存的吗？人类如果永生了，还需要创新和传承吗？ Yeah. Uh, 我想这, uh, I think so. Let's first. Uh, how about uh, Jose? You uh, share with your idea with this question firstly. Uh, yes, actually, it is a very important point. I believe we are going to have immortality not only once but tw twice. Twice immortality. We are going to have immortality of the software, as I was talking about. Cogno and info technology, immortality of the software, and also immortality of the hardware through biotechnology and nanotechnology. So not one, but two immortalities, the software and the hardware, which is the physical immortality and the computational immortality. And both of them I see happening at about the same time the time of the singularity in 2045. So yes, we will be immortal twice, uh, computationally and biologically. And uh, that will be fantastic. We will also merge with the cloud, with internet, and that will make us much smarter, uh, much more intelligent. We will process a lot more information. We will communicate even without speaking. You know, I cannot speak Chinese and probably many of you don't speak Spanish, but once we connect our brains, we will communicate regardless of language. So actually, I love artificial intelligence and all the developments thanks to artificial intelligence that will make us more intelligent, more creative, more innovative. So I love artificial intelligence. I am not afraid of artificial intelligence. What I am afraid of is human stupidity. And that worries me because humans, we are born stupid and some of us remain stupid all of our lives. So that is the worry for the future of humanity, not artificial intelligence, but human stupidity. Thank you. Gotcha, thanks. So you have hold a very positive attitude towards uh, um, the innovation as well as the longevity. And how about uh, Alex, your point? So I, of course, think that longevity is the most altruistic uh, cause anyone can pursue today. Because if you start thinking not in terms of money, but in terms of uh, quality adjusted life years that you generate during your life for everybody. So for example, if you reproduce, you might have created you know, 100, 200 uh, quality adjusted life years. If you extend the life of everybody on the planet by just one year, you created at least 8 billion years of life. A good surgeon saves maybe um, 
hundred uh, thousand uh, life years in their career. So it's the most important thing to go after and it's most altruistic. In terms of digital immortality and possibly you know, transfer and consciousness and uh, creating the digital copy of yourself by copying the brain, I'm actually very afraid of this technology. And uh, you know, I'm not afraid of dying, but I'm very afraid of being locked in a digital hell, right? Because imagine a scenario where you can be copied many times over and uh, put into different scenarios. Uh, so if it's not you, if it's your copy, you might not feel the affinity to that person, but uh, it is a person, right? And uh, the amount of suffering that could be inflicted digitally and uh, over extended periods are currently unpredictable. So that's a big kind of philosophical argument, whether we should go that route or not. Yeah, I like to your point, especially uh, your point is a very uh, fit with our topic, digital immortality. Uh, I think that digital immortality will be the first uh, compared with uh, um, physical immortality when arrived with us. So, uh, James, what's your point? Uh, sorry, you mute yourself. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, digital mortality, first of all, is much harder. Um, you know, the AI model today has taught us that, you know, to understand the AI model, to understand it, <clears throat> almost impossible. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> it is almost impossible to understand the, the AI algorithm right it's a black box um, with billions of parameters we don't have any clue and this is still hallucinate to, you know without our understanding uh, so we couldn't even understand the model we built how can we understand the brain it was still far far away and in terms of um, efficiency or energy consumption our algorithm uh, still millions of times um, worse uh, than uh, our brain. So to understand our brain is much, much harder than um, other, uh, to that building something like a brain. And if you don't understand how brain works, how can we connect or download or upload? Uh, that's almost impossible. So I think this is a very hard technology. It will be much harder than the biological immortality. So I think the biological, and, and apart from that, uh, there's also this, um, you know, multiple conscious issue. Um, the other thing is, yeah, if you create a conscious and if you don't have the ability, maybe you're, some, you're still aware of yourself and you kind of achieve immortality, right? Forever you're aware of yourself, but without ability, without the ability to appreciate, you know, the environment, appreciate the creativity or the ongoing, you know, novelty of your world without able to create yourself the new things or creating children it's like a hell <laughs> so 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 i think innovation and keep creating or keep experiencing new uh it's very important and even though everybody you know can live forever i think keep the society keep the human civilization uh keep innovating and uh, keep progressing uh, keep you know experiencing and creating new things and new children is just as important. Uh, so I, I think innovation is uh, still the key, um, still the central for the uh, for the purpose of living. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, we like to expand our lifespan, but meanwhile, we also hopefully to um, be more innovative. So I think uh, for the panel discussion, we have uh, um, finished right now. And uh, the last part is the uh, Q&A. So before Q&A, we also have a, a gift for the uh, audience here who will raise the questions. We will give, send the upcoming uh, book, The Death of Death. The Chinese name is Yong Shen uh, to the, to the uh, audience who raised the question uh, in the next um, part. So for this book, Death of Death, uh, this book is a co-author is uh, Jose Cordero, and uh, I am the co-translator. 
Also, this book uh, will be published by People's uh, um, Publish House. And uh, here, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Gong Shezhang. Hello, Gong Shezhang. Can you give us a brief about this book, Longevity, The Death of Death? 我们接下来的话会有一个Q&A的环节，我们Q&A的环节的话会送出呃永生这本书。关于这本书的一个简单介绍，我们想先请龚社长花简单几分钟跟大家介绍一下。Hello，大家好，呃，非常高兴向大家
um, since we are studying the genetic part and the idea of in the future whether people can achieve immortality, but my question is about um, for the for the scholars, how do you know for now um, us as uh, human beings as a species is already like some idea and a creation from the idea of immortality? Are we uh, possibly uh, created by the programming of some supernatural god <laughs> uh, already? Like how 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 do you know um, we are like real human species or are we already? Uh, some uh, some some type of immortality creation uh, for now, creature. Yeah, thank you. I can take that if you like, but <laughs> sure, please go ahead. Sure. So I think that the probability that we are living in a recursive simulation is very high because uh, we see that um, many video games that are available today, uh, the most captivating ones are actually uh, open world games where you recreate the environment in your image. And you've got virtual characters there that, uh, you know, the more intelligent they are, the more interesting the game. And uh, we see that uh, generative AI is now being used more and more in uh, open world games where you want to have automatically created uh, worlds that you, for example, can visit. So from that, uh, we can probably judge that uh, it's very interesting to live an alternative reality, but in your image. Uh, and very often now those games are being used to develop certain strategies or to invent. So I think that uh, in order for you to make the game even more interesting, you need to make it very immersive. And to make it very immersive, you need to even forget that you uh, are playing, right? So the probability that we are currently playing a video game uh, in a multiplayer scenario is actually, I think, in my opinion, is pretty high. And that it's in our image also pretty high. As a matter of fact, only religious people who believe that, you know, believe in, their, in those books, <laughs> Uh, like, you know, the Bible and the alternatives, um, they automatically subscribe to the philosophy that they are artificial intelligence, that have, they have been created by just one developer or several. Um, and it's a pretty acceptable kind of thought concept. Uh, I think that from the, from the philosophical perspective, the probability that this world is a simulation is very high. Uh, just to give a counter argument, um, I, I, I think we are not living in a simulation. We might be in the future, uh, but also if we were talking about this two centuries ago, people couldn't even understand the concept of a simulation. Uh, so maybe in the future it will be possible. I don't think it is real now. But the other question about death, uh, the idea of death and what happens if we are already immortal. Uh, well, I am an engineer and I am a very practical person. So I believe that we are here, we are alive, we are conscious, and we don't know what happens when we die, if we die. But we are sure about this reality, which I don't think is a simulation. So I enjoy being alive, and I want to continue being alive for as long as I can. If then we move into simulated worlds, that would be okay in the future. But uh, so far, so good. So I wish you not to die. Uh, even if it is a simulation, try to stay alive. Yeah, OK. <laughs> My take is that if it is a simulation, you know, I'm not sure. I don't think so. But even if it is a simulation, and uh, the purpose of our the playing this game is uh, to do crazy things and to, you know, to, to, to shock, to surprise. Our, you know, our God, our designer, uh, to you know, create something unexpected, and I think that's what the designer would like to see. Also, whatever God or designer you want to call it, you know, uh, he would like to see that his uh, whatever he's uh, you know he designed uh, doing something unexpectedly, you know, surprisingly good. I agree, one hundred percent. Very cool. I can see you are all doing what you're believing, <laughs> so that's great. Uh, next question.
Well, are we getting this is the only question? Okay. So yeah, I think someone have a, a private investor me a question. So this question is, uh, what is the difference between the robotics rights versus uh, humans rights? If in the near future, AIGC has a, a very uh, advanced, uh, we call this uh, AGI. So what's, what's, the, um, what's the human rights versus uh, robotics rights? So I think it's, uh, it's not just a technical question, it's also an ethical and a social questions. Um, well, I'll just give a quick answer. I think that artificial intelligences and uh, robots and some other uh, non-human life forms should have rights uh, and different types of rights, like um, even plants uh, or animals. You could say that animals have rights and plants have rights because they are alive. Uh, even a, a rock, which is not alive, as far as we know, might have some rights, not at the same level. But anyway, so yes, um, AIs, artificial intelligence and robots should have rights. But in the future, I think we are going to merge with the technology, just like I am merged with my glasses. I need my glasses to see, or I need my mobile telephone uh, for so many things. Uh, this will probably be in our brain in 10 years or in 20 years. Uh, so it will augment me. I will be an augmented uh, human and probably I will have different rights because I will not be the same person that if I don't have a mobile phone or if I don't have glasses or if I don't have clothes or if I were living in the caves uh, 50,000 years ago. Yeah, well, I actually think that we need to think about uh, if if artificial intelligence progresses to the level where it will need to have rights, it will also scale very quickly, and uh, we will the, the the question will be reversed. Like, what rights will humans have, right, in the age of uh, uh, AI supremacy? Uh, and uh, there we are back to the laws of robotics, uh, right? Isimov's uh, laws, for example, uh, you know, do not harm the human. <laughs> uh, so we should have the right not to be harmed. I really hope that we stick to that right, but that's of course a joke, right? I think that uh, once we get there, we will figure it out. But right now it's just too early to talk about that. Well, Okay. Um, well, I think I think uh, that that's a question of whether or not the robots will have consciousness, right? And the consciousness will, I think, consciousness will emerge automatically. I mean, we can train the robots to fear, you know, to fear death, or to you know, love procreation or love replication. That's you know how evolution uh, allow human to have those. Uh, consciousness or emotions, uh, but uh, uh, I'm not sure we will, you know, human will will train robots to have those uh, objective function like fearing of death and loving uh, replication. So I think consciousness, I think, think it's a very careful, you know, very difficult, but also, you know, very risky uh, endeavor that probably, you know, human will, will shy away from training the robots to have. Uh, so, so, so I, I think uh, this, uh, this is still far away from, um, you know, many, many, uh, yeah, far, far away in the future, yeah. Okay, I think that's probably gonna call the end of our session today. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Uh, for me personally, it's a learning uh, two hours and it's actually reassuring a way to under realize that even as our speakers who also have, you know, who have aspirations, but also concerns, even 
you know, scared about certain aspects of the topic, which, you know, makes me feel like, okay, this is something that, that still will take a little bit more time to arrive, but uh, it's definitely an eye-opening session. And thank you so much for everyone for taking the weekend morning, but also for James, I know you are uh, late, uh, late evening in uh, the, the US and especially for Professor Code Darrow in Europe now, he, starting the morning at 4 a.m. So really, really appreciate everyone's uh, devotion to, to the uh, curiosity of, of human beings. So thank you all. And we hope uh, we will connect at some other point in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.